Welcome to church. You're glad to be here today. Come on, let's put our hands together. Now the darkness fades. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to hope beyond. Our creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God. Come on, church. We will not be moved.
sing all the earth. All the earth will sound your praise. Our hearts will cry these bones. Come on, church, sing it. In Church, one more time, believe it. It is your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. God, today we believe what we see. We trust that you're in this place right now. So with everything that you've given us, we give it back through our thanks and through our praise. No matter our circumstance, right now we put it aside and we focus directly on you. We give you honor and we give you praise right now. Jesus, you're so worthy. You're so worthy. God, we love you. We love you. We love you. And the church said, amen. Come on, can we give God praise right now? All across this place with your hands, with your mouth, give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Amen. What an awesome time already today. Hey, before we go any further, I want you to turn to your neighbors, say hello, give them a high five, and you can go ahead and take a seat. morning City Hope Church. You guys sound amazing this morning and I just want to welcome you to church this morning. My name is Vanessa Fridge and I am the Malvis campus pastor and let me just say if this is your very first time here I just want to say welcome. So church family can you help me welcome all of our first time guests this morning. We are so honored that you're here and I would love the opportunity to personally meet you just after this service in a place called The Square. I just wanna shake your hand and, and just give you a gift and say thank you for being with us today. And I don't know if any of you are, are kinda like me, but, but I hope your Thanksgiving was great and you're kinda still recovering, right, from all that you ate from Thanksgiving. So I hope that, that you guys had an incredible Thanksgiving holiday with your family and your friends. And I, I just wanna, um, 
call out just for a moment. I just want to recognize our volunteers. You know, I think most of you guys would probably agree with me that we have the most incredible volunteer team on the planet right here at City Hope Church. And I'm just, I'm super, I'm super proud of all these guys. And they, they, just, they just pour out and just love so well. And if, if you're sitting on the bench and, and maybe you're not on a serve team yet, let me just encourage you. You're missing out. That's where community is, and that's how you get to know people. And it's really something that's bigger than yourself. So let me just encourage you that today, after this service at 1130, our next class will be taking place. And that is your next step to get on a serve team. Well, guys, I just want to thank our City Hope family for your generosity and your faithfulness in giving your tithes and offerings. And because of that, we get to spread the love of Jesus to our community. And in just six days, we have the largest outreach event that we do as a church body. And we are super excited that we get to be a part of Merry Christmas Gulf Coast. And in those of you that have been involved in it before, know that it's a life-changing experience for families and for our volunteers and for our community. So it's not too late. If you haven't signed up or you haven't given yet, just simply go to cityhope.cc or stop by the square on your way out today. I want you to, I want you to join my family as we lock arms to serve and, and love our community. Well, it's been an incredible day so far, but before we continue, I want to check this out. When we create the right kind of identity, we can say things to the world around us that they don't actually believe make sense. We can get them to do things that they don't think they can do. MCGC is an event where we provide gifts for families who otherwise may not have an opportunity to bless their own. $100 provides a bicycle, gifts, and food for an entire family. If that's more than you can give, then by all means, give what you can. The more we give, the more families will be impacted. You judge the character of a society, not by how they treat the rich and the powerful and the privileged, but by how they treat the poor the condemned, the incarcerated, because it's in that nexus that we actually begin to understand truly profound things about who we are. Hello, City Hope. I sense a little turkey residue. Man, it's bad. Really bad. It's great to see you in church. I hope you can see me. You're not sleeping. Welcome our Mobile Campus, Foley Campus, Baymanette, and all the guys at the Correctional Facility. Thank you for joining us this weekend, uh, the weekend of Thanksgiving. I trust you had a great Thanksgiving. A couple things I want to tell you. We just returned a couple days ago from our annual Israel trip. We had a fantastic trip. Thank you for keeping us in your prayers. We do this every November. If you get an opportunity, we'd love you to go with us. Annually, we make that journey. Uh, also, I want to encourage you, if you have not given to Merry Christmas Gulf Coast, uh, it's $100 per family. I know you've been busy. You forget. But I want you to understand this is something that we've been doing a long time. It is our DNA. It is the greatest outreach event of the year. It is phenomenal, and, and here's what I've always shared is we're, City Hope Church, we're going to do this. If you want in on the blessing from this, then you need to invest in this because we are a blessed church, and so we're doing this not hoping you're going to get on board. We're doing this, and you want to be part of it. Uh, I've had families who there are four or five members in their family, and they would do one for each member of their family, thinking that there's a family out there of four or five or six people 
that they're going to have Christmas because of my family. So I encourage you to do that. It's coming up real soon, and we want you to be part of that, not only in giving but also in serving. Well, uh, I don't know about you, but I love Thanksgiving holidays. Anybody here? Okay. I, I can tell right now that you're in worse shape than the other group. Uh, you are really nodding off, so I'm going to have to, you know, do something. Uh, I've come to realize about Thanksgiving that taking day off and overeating does not make me thankful. Uh, but what does make us thankful? We know Thanksgiving is about giving thanks, but what if we could live that way? Not just a holiday to remind me that, that I'm blessed, but a lifestyle of living thankfully. Well, you see, when we give thanks, there's an attitude of gratitude. And, and this is an attitude that you want to instill in your children, right? An attitude of gratitude. Okay. I'll quit asking questions. An attitude is the way we think. And the way we think actually will release things in our lives or restrict things in our lives, the way you think. And it's very important that we have an attitude of gratitude spiritually too. That's what I want to talk about. So I, I want to start before, I, this is kind of like the intro to get into this message. I'm going to take a verse in Psalms 100 verse 4 that most of you have probably heard. And I want to break this down for you. So Psalms 100, verse 4, the first part, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. That Hebrew word there for thanksgiving is todah. It means a thank offering presented in the temple. So enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That word praise there is tehillah, and it means a song of praise. So enter into his courts with praise and be thankful to him. That Hebrew word there is yada, and it means to give thanks with extended hands. So be thankful to him and bless his name. Barak, it means an act of adoration by bowing. So bless his name. So let me take that and modernize that. 21st century. So we enter into his gates with thanksgiving. We come into his courts with praises. And we're thankful by extending our hands and bless him by bowing before him. You see, praise is basically acknowledging what God has done, is doing, and will do in our lives. And there is a purpose for praise. The purpose of praise is to get God into our environment. The power of praise is the presence of God in our lives. So when we have an attitude of gratitude and express it by giving thanks, here, here's the, the secret is, taking it to, is to take it to another place called praise. In this message, I, I want to show you the secret of praise. But I want you to know this, that praise is initiated by us and worship is God's response to our praise. And the truth is, you, you cannot worship God unless you have first praised him. Praise is, it, it has to be genuine, genuine praise. True praise is tough because, you know, the, the results are awesome because everything we need is in God's praise, in, in God's presence. You know, mercy and power and victory and wisdom. These are the gifts of God's presence. But our focus is not to be on that, to search. It's to search him. So I want to take a story in the Old Testament that all of you know. And I'm going to jump right in the middle of the story. Because we know the story of Joseph. We know that he was sold into slavery. We know he became the governor of Egypt. And, but in the middle of the story, there's a crisis. There's a famine in the land. Uh, there's no rain. Animals are dying. People are dying. And, and so his father is going to send his brothers to Egypt because remember God gave Joseph a plan to store up the warehouses for food to get through the seven years of famine. So we're in the middle of the story and then I'll come back and break this down of what it looks like. Genesis 44, 14. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house and he was still there and they fell down to him on the ground and Joseph said to them, what deed is this you've done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? Then Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? How shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, but we, both we and also he whom the cup was found. But he said, far be it from me that I should do so. The man is whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as far as you go up to, to be with peace with your father. And then Judah came near to him and said, oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing. Do not let your anger burn against your servant, for even you are like Pharaoh. You're, you're equal to Pharaoh. So let me, let me give you the story. So I want you to stay with me. Here is the father, Jacob. He sends his sons. He's going to send ten sons to Egypt 
to find food. He hears there's food. They're going to starve to death. When they come in, now remember, it's been over 20 years since they've seen each other. Joseph immediately recognizes his brothers because the brothers haven't changed. They didn't recognize him. Joseph has changed. He spent 13 years in a, in a pit in Potiphar's house and in a prison, and that changed him and made him available to serve God as Pharaoh's right hand. So we, we all have family, friends, and, and, and church members that, you know, they haven't changed. And you may be growing and maturing, but they've not. And we can see these people are the same as they were 15 years ago. Your life is changing, but you, they can't recognize you, but you recognize them because they carry the same attitude. They have the same attitude, the disposition, bitterness, angry, frustration. They're alone. So they're stuck, yet life goes on. Eventually, a famine will hit their world. Eventually, a famine comes into their world. Go back to the story. So Joseph is missing his youngest brother, Benjamin. Benjamin is not part of the ten who sold him into slavery. In fact, Jacob has two wives, Leah and Rachel. They both have two servants. They have servants. And so uh, these, Jacob basically has 12 sons by four different women. But Rachel has two, and it's, it's Joseph and Benjamin. And so Joseph is the recipient of the ten brothers who have envy and jealousy. They sell him into slavery. Now Joseph's concerned about his baby brother Benjamin, and he wants to get him from the father's house and get him into his house. So when they come in, they don't recognize him. Joseph recognizes them, and he accuses them of being spies. He sends them back, but he keeps one of the brothers, Simeon, and he requires them, I'll release Simeon. You go get Benjamin and bring him back. Simeon's a half-brother. So he prepares a meal. They eat. But Joseph has a plan. What's his plan? I want to keep Benjamin, and I want to get rid of the rest. The ten, I want to get rid of them. I want to keep my one brother. So you know the story. Uh, they do bring Benjamin back. And then Joseph has his people, as they start to leave, plant this cup, Joseph's cup, in the bag on, on, on the animal. And so as they're leaving, Joseph says, go, go check them and see if they stole anything. And so they go and they stop them. They search their sacks and bags and they find the cup in Benjamin's bag and they brought them back to Joseph's house. That's what we just read. When they come into Joseph's house, verse 14, I've already read it, but I'm going to read it again. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there, and they fell down before him on the ground. They fell down on the ground. Now, I want you to notice something, that in this story, if you've not read this story, you can read it. It's in Genesis 42, 43, 44, 45. It's a great story. So Judah is the leader. He's the one who's doing all the talking. R Reuben is the eldest. He should have been, but he's not because there's a crisis. There's a famine. Protocol says the eldest would speak and lead, but when, when you have a famine, you have a crisis, you, you don't turn to protocol. You turn to the one who knows how to praise. Judah's name literally is a word for praise. Well, why is this so important? So, so watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the names of some people, and I'm going to use types and shadows because when you hear the name Judah, I want you to think of the word praise. Because in this message, the secret of praise, I'm going to show you what the secret is. So I'm going to use this story, and, and I want you to understand why this is important. Praise is what attracts God's presence to us. Praise is what gets God's presence in our lives, in our homes. What gives you access to God is your ability to praise God. And, and so what, to do that, you really have to forget about you and think about him. Praise is something that even the lowest of mankind can do to get to Jesus. So you, you don't have to think of yourself, well, I'm just this nobody. No, no, if you praise, you have access to the King, Jesus Christ. Now, in the story, they didn't ask the firstborn to be the spokesman in the story. And, and, but they didn't ask Simeon. They, they, he holds Simeon back. Simeon's name means hearing. Hearing. So praise has this intercessory value that surpasses everything. So when you praise, you're not just so emotional, you're out of control. But, and, 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 and then if you bow down and worship and pray and worship God, you're, you're not just ignorant of what you're doing. You're not going through some form or format. When you praise, you're, you're elevated like no other person. Like, when you praise the Lord, you, you're, you're elevated into the presence of God. So the name Judah comes from the root word of yada. And that means to throw one's hands up in confession of one's sins. So the primary word for praise implies an admission of guilt. In other words, you can't truly praise and not admit you're all messed up. How many of you know you're messed up? Okay, the rest of you are going to get a really a good revelation today. 
You can't be religious or self-righteous and praise the Lord. Why? Because praise levels the field. Praise levels the field. Everybody who raises their voice and lifts their hands is a mess. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. And, and the only reason I'm here is because his mercies are new every day. That's the only reason I'm here. So whether you're rich or you're poor, you're educated, uneducated, whether you're perfect, you know, you're one of those who's got it all together. No, you are here by the grace of God. So Judah, the name, it also implies a confessional value. So I'll show you what I mean. When the woman, remember the woman who washes Jesus' feet with her tears, wipes his feet with her hair, then pours anointing oil on Jesus, and everybody in the room starts complaining, the word says that Jesus forgives her of her sin. So you think, well, what's so unique about that? Well, she never asked for forgiveness. She never admitted sin. She never confessed she was guilty. She simply worshiped at his feet. And if you're here today and your life's a mess, or maybe you're here today and you, you've got a doctor's report in the last few days that, 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 that your body is a mess, I want to tell you, you go to Jesus and you worship him and you love him and you say, well, yeah, but I've made mistakes. You, you still love him. I made one today. You still love him. You still want, because worship releases redemption. So go back to the story. Judah and the brothers come. There's 10 of them, and they're being set up by Joseph. Joseph, the guy that you know, we admire and lift up. No, this is a setup by Joseph. So Judah, praise, is the counterattack for a setup. So remember, it said they fell at Joseph's feet. Verse 14, we read it. In the Hebrew, the word is nafal. It means to lay prostrate. It means to lay in posture of worship. Now, just so you know, many Hebrew words didn't originate in the Hebrew language. In fact, many words originated in the Chaldeans or in the Akkadian language, like the word Elohim. You may have heard that word. It's from the Chaldeans, and the Jews borrowed it. The word cherubim is, is from the Akkadians. It's borrowed by the Jews. This word, Nafal, is borrowed from the Akkadians. In their original language, it is a military term, not a worship term. So I'll illustrate it this way. When the Akkadians are going to battle, they had a strategy. The strategy was to get the enemy as close as they could to them so they could fool them. So what they would do, they would line up their first rank of soldiers and they would give them the short spears, two and three feet long. The enemy would look and scout and see, here's their first rank, and then they realized they had short spears so we can use our lances and our spears and we can destroy the first rank of the Akkadian army. So the enemy would come in very close, 12 to 15 feet, and begin to fight. Based on the length of their spears and considering the length of the Akkadian swords, and then in the middle of the battle at the right time, the sergeant of arms would shout the word, Nafal. And the first rank, instead of fighting, would fall flat on the ground. And hiding behind them from view were the archers. And then they would pull back their bows. And many times they would wipe out the first and second rank of the enemy's army. So when the enemy comes in close and begins to fight you, how do you know? He, he, he hates you. If you're a believer, the enemy hates you. So guess what? He's going to fight you. When he comes in to fight you, what you have to learn to do is you have to learn to fall, fall down to worship. And at first, the enemy's going to say, it looks like they have no fight in them. They just, they just fell down. But look again, because God is standing there behind you, and he says to the enemy, oh, you thought you came to fight with Jerry. No, you, you, you came to fight me. And when you fall down... When you bow down to worship, you, you, you may look foolish, you may look weak, you may look crazed, but you fall down and worship God, he's behind you, he's on your side. In the physical, it's okay, but I'm talking specifically in the heart. You bow your heart before him. So the question is, are there any here who are willing to fall down and worship? Let's go back to the story, because the story did not defer to Reuben to speak or to Simeon, but why not Simeon? I mean, Simeon's name means hearing. Well, we know there's a verse in the Bible that says faith comes by hearing. Hearing. If you go back and you look at the history of the 12 tribes of Israel, their distribution of the promised land when they get there, you'll see that inside the land of Judah is the land of Simeon. In other words, the land of Simeon is surrounded by Judah. And all the other tribes, they get their land, they're distinguished of the borders of other countries. But they're not in the center of Judah. So if Simeon went south, north, east, or west, he's in Judah. He's in the praise. He's, he's walking in praise. So that lets me know that you can have faith and not praise God. It lets me know that you can be a believer and not praise God. But you can't have praise and not get faith. 
You, you, you cannot have, if, if you're going to praise, you're going to get faith. Faith always, praise always brings faith. So why didn't they defer to Simeon to do the talking? Listen, remember, he, he's represent hearing. Hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Because faith is, is good, but it's not the best. Why? Faith needs time to substantiate things. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. So let me illustrate it this way. You go to the doctor and the doctor says you have th three months to live. You use faith, you're hoping for the miracle. If you get an unexpected bill and you have 30 days to pay it, you use faith to hope for the funds to come in to pay the bill. Faith works when it has time to hope for it. But when you don't have time to hope, when you're in the middle of a crisis, when you need God now, you, you don't need faith first, you need praise first. Why? Praise always brings faith. If you're in a crisis, you start praising. I love you, Lord. I worship you. I thank you. Praise works in a crisis when everything else fades. So praise, here's what it does. Watch, I'm going to prove it to you. Praise brings the eternal into the now. I'm in a crisis now. I'm in a famine now. I, my, my job, my finances, my health, my marriage, my children, whatever's going on. Praise brings the eternal into the now. The, the, the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The introduction of the Lord's Prayer is, is worship. And the moment you begin to worship, heaven and earth become joined, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in, as it is in heaven. So when you praise, you don't have to get to heaven, heaven comes to you. When you praise, you don't have to get to your blessing, your blessing comes to you. When you praise, you don't have to find healing, healing comes to you. Praise brings it into the now, from the future to the now. I'll show you what I mean. There's a woman in the New Testament who came to Jesus and her daughter needed a miracle. And she goes to Jesus and Jesus says, wait, you're, you're a Gentile. It's, it's not time for you. To, there's going to be another story in a few more chapters where Peter's going to have a vision. Cornelius is going to come to his house and this whole thing with the Gentiles is going to work out. But it's not time. And Jesus said to her, it's not meat for me to give food from the master's tables to the dogs. The dogs are referring to the Gentiles. That's the way the Jewish people looked at the Gentiles. Dogs. The lowest, part of earth, the lowest form of earth. So she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. So this woman had already started to worship Jesus, and what was happening was future reality became present reality. She got her miracle. But the, the release of it was, was, was days and days ahead, but it came immediately, just like David and Goliath. He goes, he goes to Goliath and he says, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. But wait a minute, David, you don't even know the name of the Lord yet. You, Jesus is not here yet, you don't know the name. And Dave would say, it's okay, but I don't have time to wait for the angel to go to Mary and say, his name shall be called Jesus. I don't have time to wait for Paul to write, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I don't have time for that. I need a miracle now. There's a giant in my path. I need a miracle now. His praise for the name of the Lord reached into the future, brought the name back into the present. He slayed the giant with a name he didn't even know yet. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it. Remember the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman? She came to Jesus. He says, where's your husband? She said, I don't have one. He said, you're right. You've had five and you're living with a guy. Married to five men, lives with one. Five and one equals six. Six is the number of man. Six is the number of flesh. She meets the seventh man, Jesus, the perfect man. She doesn't need anyone else. She met her true spiritual husband, Jesus. When she meets him, watch her first question is, where shall I worship? And Jesus said, the hour comes and now is. But wait, wait a minute, Jesus. It, it doesn't make sense. Is it coming or is it now? It all depends on your perception and worship. True worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. When you begin to worship, then what you're waiting on, you get. She changed the subject from her mess to his praise. He never talked about her messed up life again. He revealed the kingdom of God to her in worship. When you begin to worship, what you're believing for becomes present day reality. I'm going to say that again. When you begin to worship, what you're believing for becomes present day reality. So listen. <laughs> Stay with me. Stay with me. I know you got turkey fog, but just hang on. Faith always needs a future event. In other words, you cannot praise for what you do not have. Because praise is the testimony of truth. Praise needs a present reality. 
So whatever you praise for, you, you praise because you believe you have it. I'm not praising for it. I'm praising like, I, I just got it. I just got the healing. I, my marriage is going to be restored. I, I just got my, my family's going to be saved. My husband's going to be saved. I, I, I'm going to get the incomes right, the blessing. The child's going to be delivered. That's how we praise. So go back to the story. The brothers are not guilty of this offense, but we're guilty of other offenses. And God has no illusions about you. He, he knows your mess. You can't hide it from him. And in fact, nothing will shock him. In fact, he knew what you're going to do before you did it. And he still loves you. He knew all the bad things that you were going to do, and then you did them, and he still saved you. So the ten brothers were guilty, but Benjamin was innocent. So guilty you praise, not guilty you praise. Wherever you are in life, you give praise to God. Don't let doubt keep you from praise, because you're supposed to come and praise even in your mess. And some people think, well, when I get my life put together, I can praise him. If you could fix the mess, you wouldn't need him. You're supposed to come to him even, even when you're messed up. He said, come to me all who are heavy laden and burdened. Bring your mess. Bring your burden. Because if not, you're acting like a hypocrite. How many times do you come in and the, and the worship and the presence of God is here? A message is given. An invitation is given. And what do you do? You act like the hypocrite. You, 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 it, it's a, it comes from a, a theatrical term. You, you put on this facade and this face and you leave like you've got it all together. When we don't have it all together. None of us have it all together. And there's times and seasons where we need to come, yet people are trying to get their life together before giving their total life to Jesus. And Jesus would say to you, if you could get your life together, I, I'd never had to die on the cross. Jesus will say to you, they took me apart so I could put you back together. Jesus would say to you, give me a chance because I have grace and mercy and power that's necessary to get you to where I want you to be. I, I have a purpose for you, what I intended you to become. So the brothers are guilty of selling Joseph, but they still praise the Lord. You ever been guilty and felt like God left you and he's not talking to you and you, you go to church and you walk in and you start to praise and all of a sudden he starts to talk to you or he touches your life and you think, come on, Jesus, why are you doing this? I'm not worthy. I, I, I'm not worthy. And Jesus says, you don't get it yet. You just don't get it. I love you in spite of you. Even if you don't want me, even if you try to stop me, quench me, I love you. You'll never stop me from loving you. So what does that mean? That I'm going to praise him when I'm wrong. I'm going to praise him when I'm right. In the story, only one person talked and had anything to say, and it was Judah praise. And it says over, and Judah said, and Judah said, and Judah said. So Judah said to Joseph, we read it, how shall we clear ourselves and, and, and what do we do? And Joseph answered, Judah, go home, take the brothers with you, but leave Benjamin, uh, Benjamin with me. By Egyptian law, they said he could have killed all of them, but he let them go, but I'm going to keep Benjamin. Joseph, watch, did not know that praise does not settle for partial victory. What do you mean? Praise does not settle for what God, some of what God says. It doesn't settle for half of what God's promised. Judas said, oh, no. I'm paraphrasing. Oh, no. If I don't get Benjamin, I'm not going home. In other words, if you don't release Benjamin, you're not releasing me. Some of you have dreams and visions. Some of those have been fulfilled. Your life comes in seasons. So there's, there's dreams and visions. And maybe you're in a new season, a new age bracket, or a new category of season. And some of the dreams and visions have been fulfilled. But are you satisfied with a portion? Are you satisfied with what's happened already? Or do you realize that there's more with the third part of your life, the fourth part of your life, the fifth? Because you see, people who praise God should think like this. Oh, no, I want everything he promised. I want everything he declared. I want my marriage healthy. I want my family whole. I want to be healed and whole. I want to be blessed. I want, to be, I want him to be my defender, to be behind my back. Everything he's promised, I want. And I'm not going to stop praising until I get it. So, so watch. Faith says, I believe God will heal me. Faith says, God's going to deliver me. Faith says God's going to make a way. Praise says it this way. God, you're a healer. Praise says it, and I'll use some Hebrew words. Praise says Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord is my righteousness. Praise says Jehovah in Kadesh, the Lord who sanctifies me. Praise says Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of peace. Praise says the Jehovah Shema, the Lord is here. 
the Lord is there. Praise says Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Praise says Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provisions have been seen. Praise says Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner and my covering. Jehovah, uh, praise says Jehovah Rahi, the Lord is my shepherd. And when I praise, watch, when I praise and reveal his name and who he is, God's word then is out and his reputation is at stake. So you, you want to know the secret of praise? I had 22 people in the first service. You want to know the secret of praise? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, you can go home. Just kidding. I got guards at the door. They'll take you out. <laughs> the secret of praise is, watch, the recalling of what is promised until it's fulfilled. The secret of praise is the recalling of what is promised until it's fulfilled. The only brother of the ten who's talking is Judah. Praise. The more praise talk, Judah, the more praise talk, the more Joseph becomes uncomfortable. Remember, this is a setup. This is Joseph's plan. The more Joseph then began to forget about revenge and anger. And he starts talking about forgiveness. He starts remembering and, and saying, I'm not blaming you. And God allowed this. And I mean, it, it all starts to change because here's what happens. Praise will help you forget about the pain of what you've been through. We'd rather sit and soak in the negative and the woe is me and the poor me that mama did this and daddy did that and that job happened this way and that boss did this and this was unfair and this was unjust, this, this was injustice and this and this and this. Instead of sitting at the feet of Jesus and offering praise to him, because praise will help you forget about the pain of what you've been through. So watch, Judah didn't give up. He kept on, he kept on, praise kept on. Joseph couldn't take praise anymore. So you know what he did? He pulled the veil back to who he really was. Hey, I'm Joseph. He started speaking in Hebrew. He's been speaking in Egyptian before, in Aramaic, Arabic. But now he starts speaking in, in Hebrew. And they recognize it's, it's, it's Joseph. He couldn't take it. He pulled the veil back of who he was. When you praise God, watch, God then can dig inside and he finds those little secret things that maybe you don't even know that have hurt you. That's causing a mess, causing pain and hurt. And the secret is in your spirit, and he reveals it. He releases it when you praise him. So praise not only reveals our hurt and our weakness, but praise also reveals our strengths. You, you want to know what your strengths are? Do you want to know what your strengths are? The dreams, the purpose, the visions, and the destiny that God put inside of you. Oh, yeah, God did it before you were born, before you were formed. He put that in there. It's in there. I'm not going to leave it on the shelf somewhere in heaven. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to leave it floating around somewhere in the heavenly realm. When you will find that seeking God at first is very difficult. I've had people talk to me about this praise and this and that. I, I understand. You, you'll find seeking God is difficult because your wants and needs clamor for attention. We, one of the words of worship is to extend your hands toward him and worship him. We've used the illustration of surrender, and that's true. But let me give you a better illustration of that. When your baby's nine months old, 12 months old, and they're crawling around on the floor, and you walk by that baby, and that baby sticks both hands up, up on their knees, wanting you to pick them up. You grow up, kid. I ain't got time for this. No, if you do that, you're an idiot. No. You, you can't have, you, what are you going to do? You're going to reach down and pick them up. That's what the Father wants from us. You're his children. Life has thrown you a mess. Sometimes you get through it, sometimes it's still there. Because your behaviors are certain ways because of the mess and things that happen. And you see, he knows what you've come through. He knows the problems. He knows the burdens. And he understands all of that. But here's this. Listen, he enjoys you seeking his face before you seek his hand. But here, here's what I'm saying. Praise is a sacrifice. We don't like sacrifice. We don't even, we have a hard, some of us have a hard time giving up $100 to sacrifice for another family because in our mindset we think, well, they need to get a job. You need to go to Calvary. Jesus said, the poor you have with you always. The heart of the father is to reach the poor, the orphan, and the widow. 
So you, you understand, praise is a sacrifice. The psalmist said, 54 and 6, I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. Psalm 7, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. Psalms 13, 6, I will sing to the Lord because he had dealt bountifully with me. Psalms 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart gladly rejoices and with my song, I will praise him. Jude tells us praise shall go first. Another psalmist says praise is God's authority and power. Another psalmist says praise is, is God is known. Another says praise is God's dwelling place. Genesis 49 says the hand of praise will be on the neck of your enemies. The Bible says praise our God, O people. Let the sound of praise be heard. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the God of your life. I will praise you as long as I live and your name will be lifted up in my hands, with my hands. Praise is a sacrifice. We don't like to sacrifice. We, we want to praise if we feel good. We want to praise good if we like the music, we like the sound, we like the tune, we like this, we like that. We want to praise if everything went well from the house to the, to the car, from the car to the church. We want, we want to praise if our team won. If our team didn't win, it's, it's like we ain't praising. Listen to this verse, I'm going to finish. Hebrews 13 and 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You may not have anything else you can bring him, but you can always give him a sacrifice of praise. Anybody not breathing? Listening to me? Anybody not breathing? Okay, that, that, that's a good starting point. Thank you, God, that I'm still alive, that I'm breathing. Anybody here, and you're in the hospital? No, you're not in the hospital. You're here. That's, that's, that's another place of starting. See, and it's the fruit of your lips. You know what that fruit means? Harvest. So the more you thank him, the more the harvest comes. The more your attitude changes. The gratitude comes. The spiritual gratitude. The sacrifice of praise won't cost you money. It will cost you, listen, this is key, the sacrifice of praise will cost you your self-centeredness and your natural tendency to dwell on whatever's wrong in your life. That, that's what keeps us from praising God. We want everything right and everything fixed, and now I can praise God. That is totally wrong. What, your self-centeredness means you've got to get you out of the way before God can sit on the seat and you can worship him. And then when, when your natural tendency is to dwell on everything that's wrong, and we take all these things that are going wrong in our world, in our job, in our house, in our marriage, with our children, and we focus on that, and the last resort, oh, yeah, it's time to go to church, let's go to church. Oh, in the church, oh, we're going to sing, we're going to praise God. And that's the only time you praise God. It's the only time you give him thanks. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking about all of these things. When you're able to flip the switch and praise him in spite of Praise him with whatever's going on in your life. Offer thanks and thanksgiving. If you don't have what you want, you give him thanks. If you don't have what you need, you give him thanks. If everything is inside out with your marriage, you give him thanks. Why? Because when you do, his presence is going to show up in your life. When his presence shows up in your life, he is going to change things that you can't change. Remember the secret of praise is the recalling of what is promised until it's fulfilled. Church, listen. God's presence is the answer to all the needs of every person. And there's going to come a day, and it's real soon, there's going to be a person who's going to have, say they have the answer to everybody's needs, and everybody's going to believe them and follow them. But I'm telling you the truth. God's presence is the answer to all your needs of every person. His presence comes through praise. The coming of his presence today in your world is dependent on your praising him. So what do we need to do? We need to praise him. We need to start praising him. And I want to end this way. And this is always dangerous when you do this. For some reason... If we say stand up, you think it's over and you go out the door. But we've got guards there today. So I want you to stand. All the campuses, come on, stand up. 
Don't leave. Look at me. Look at me. I don't know if you've understood and received what I said, but this part is real childlike. So if you don't get any of the rest of it to fit in and click, you can do this part. Because what we're going to do for just a couple minutes, we're going to offer praise to God out loud as the body of Christ. Well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what verse. I don't. No, 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 no. Just start by looking around and praising God for all the people here. Just start looking around and thanking God you can come into a house and worship him without being locked up. Just, just start thanking God that I'm breathing. I'm not in the hospital. Thanking God for your spouse, your husband, your, your wife, your family, your children, your grandparents. Just, just start thanking God that you have job, you have food on your back and you have, you have clothes on your back and food at your house and you can eat and, and you have abundance. And just, just start thanking God for all the practical stuff. You say, Pastor, is that really that important? Yes, it is. Because if you don't start with the practical stuff, you're never going to get to the other stuff. And we want to forget the practical and go to the other stuff. And God is saying, uh-uh, listen. Oh, listen. God is saying, look at my face. Praise me to my face. Don't, just pray, don't look at my hands. Don't just praise me because you want something. Praise me because of who I am. Praise me for what I've done in your life already. Praise me for what my son did. Praise me for the love that's been distributed in your life, in your marriage, in your home. And, and some of you, this is going to be very hard because you don't think God likes loud noises and, and you think God's confused if everybody prays at the same time out loud. God's got it, okay? That's your hang up. He's got it. I promise you he's got it, okay? He knows everything about everything and it's like he's got this. So here's what I want us to do. I want us, with our own mouths, nobody's listening to you, with our own mouths to start giving thanks and praise out loud together. You ready? Ready? Are you ready? Yes. My Lord, you got turkeyitis. Some of you need to jog this afternoon or something, okay? Don't take a nap. You need to do something. Get some things flowing. Okay, you ready? So your words out loud right now together. Let's go. Let's praise God. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We worship you. We thank you for your precious name. We thank you for Calvary. We thank you for your death and resurrection. We thank you that we can be believers, that we have the promise of eternity with you. Come on, church. We thank you for our homes, the covering over our heads. We thank you for the nation that we live in, that we can worship you freely. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you that we're the head and not the tail. We we thank you for the blessings that are coming in. We thank you for everything that we put our hands to. God, your favor is upon it. We thank you for your mercies that they're new every day. We thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. We thank you that you're the one true God. We thank you that you love us so much that you will never stop loving us. We give you thanks and we give you glory for all that you are and everything that you have done in our lives. And church, I want us to seal the prayer with a praise offering with our hands. This didn't start in a coliseum. This started with God's people. Come on, let's give praise unto the Lord. Come on, let's praise unto the Lord. Come on, church, shout unto the Lord. <coughs> That is good news today, that we don't have to have it all together in order to praise God. We can walk out of here tomorrow and face Monday praising God. That is good news. Guys, as our ministry team's coming forward, let me just encourage you that if you need prayer for anything today, there's a group of people that are, that are gonna be up front and, and they wanna just agree with you today. So if that's you, I invite you forward. And also, it may be that you need to make a decision today that, that, you, don't, that you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Take care of that today. Let me encourage you with that as well. Come forward, we have people that wanna agree with you and, and put, um, put some, um, a resource into your hands and help you on this new journey. Well, guys, it's been an incredible day here, and we look forward to seeing you this Saturday at Merry Christmas Gulf Coast. Have an incredible week.